The funny thing about history is that when you're in the middle of it, you can't quite tell what's going on, how important it is, what the event might actually be, in the long big picture framework. It's hard to know. Here we are today. You know, things are happening all around us. And they seem significant to some, and to others not so significant. And we won't know for decades to come, perhaps, maybe even last time at this stage of history, how important they actually were. That's the problem with history. A lot of times when you're in the middle of it, you have a sense sometimes that this is significant, this is important, and, and this may change things, but you're not quite sure. You know, the Oslo Accord was a major turning point in Jewish history, so we thought. And that was going to be the end of it. And who knows where this is going to go? And where is it today? It had an impact without question. There's no question. It had an impact. And there are things that we wish we could reverse, but it's not. It did not become what we were concerned it might become. There's lots of cases like that. And it works in the other direction as well. Sometimes events occur that people think are not so, not so significant, not so important, not so earth-shattering, game-changers type of events. And they turn out to be just the opposite. Huge, major events that you wish you could go back and rewrite everything because, boy, if we only knew that was what was going to happen, if we could have seen back then, you know, hindsight, of course, is 2020, unless you're wearing glasses. But it's, it's, a, it's a problem all throughout Jewish history. Perhaps one of the most significant and important examples of this, of course, is the Miraglim, the spies. Which, you know, we just went through the story now, and we just always breeze right through it. You know, we get to Parsha Shlach, to Parsha Balosacha, we, you know, the story, the spies, bad news, it happens very quickly, they spy the land, they come back, the evil report, Yeshua Kalev, they're the good guys, the rest are the bad guys, God gets angry, they punish the Jewish people, and we're all reading the next week's Parsha. It's like, you know, if you don't take the time to, to read the Parsha, to learn to analyze it, some of the most important lessons, we're still in exile. Today, thousands of years later, still waiting for Mashiach to come and end all of this insanity and bring back the Jewish people and usher in that period that our ancestors and our ancestors' ancestors were waiting for back in their time. And here we are still waiting for it because that Parsha is not understood. Parsha Shlach has all the keys, all the information necessary for the final redemption. And if the final redemption is not here yet, it's because that Parsha is not being understood. So let's, <laughs> told you. <laughs> let's take a closer look. It's very important. The Jewish people go out, the spy the land. Moshe sends them. God tells Moshe, I'm not sending them. It's a dangerous mission. You send them. So Moshe, Moshe sends them to this by the land. He warns them in advance what to look for, prepares them for the entire, you know, what they're going to see, what to look for, and what to bring back. He's concerned. He's concerned, without question. And they make that mistake. And they go, and they come back, and they talk about the land in such a negative way that they literally turn off an entire generation of people. This is the land that was promised to them going back to Avraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov. This is the land that Moshe told them about, that God's going to free them from Egyptian slavery to bring them to the land, the land full of milk and honey, the promised land. This is, this, is the, this is the end of the story for the Jewish people. This is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, so to speak. And 10 people come back with an evil report and ruin everything. OK, fine, that happens. That does happen. I mean, you have people who do things like that. The surprising thing about the story of the spies, of the Maranglim, is not that. The surprising thing is how they were able to do it. You have to understand, you know, in the previous parsha, Aaron and Miriam speak lash and horror about Moshe Rabbeinu, and God chastises them. He gives them tochach, he gives them criticism. He calls them out. 
They were punished already for complaining about the man. The Jewish people suffered by Mount Sinai with the golden. I mean, you have to understand, we're not talking about people who don't believe in God. We're not talking about a generation like ours today where people believe in divine providence, but they're not quite real with it because you don't have it on the level you had it back then. Right? We still go to the Makot to buy our food. It doesn't come every morning right, from the sky. The clouds that surround us usually are real. They're not the Anekava, the clouds of glory that God created to protect us from the enemy. They're there, by the way, but they're just not there like they were back at that time. How else could you explain the fact that we are sitting here right now having this sheer and relative comfort, a little bit warm, but still that's not so bad, surrounded by hundreds of millions of people who do nothing but plan our demise, from every single side, from every angle, our, 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 our nearest ally basically is the Mediterranean Sea. And it's not so friendly either. <laughs> because the clouds of glory surround us in areas of Israel. We are here miraculously, and you cannot take that for granted. Because the moment we do, we make ourselves vulnerable. It is a major, major miracle of biblical proportions that we're sitting here right now on any every day, any other day, and we go to shul, and we have these batikinosas, we have the places to shop, we have the places to go to eat, and all things we enjoy in this country. It's beautiful. I mean, I have been here for a while, amazed at the development since I was last here, and all over, and I don't know if you ventured out towards Beit Shemesh to see all the road construction, the train construction, it's incredible. And this is taking place in a country surrounded by more enemies than anybody has had historically over the course of all of history in current time. It's a big miracle. It's a huge miracle beyond imagination. Cannot take it for granted. But it was bigger for them. They had the clouds of glory. We're talking about people who lived in a camp surrounded by clouds that they knew belonged to God specifically to protect them from the elements of the desert, the dangers of the desert. They had a mystical, magical well follow them around for 40 years. The Beer Miriam, right? Everywhere they went, there was water pouring out. They could swim, they could drink, they, whatever they required, it was there, following them everywhere they went. Incredible. They could not doubt the reality of God. They did not require a seminar to make them believe in God and divine providence. It was clear and obvious. And they knew God had expectations. And they knew that God made judgments. And if you were on track, you got rewarded. And if you were off track, you got punished. They saw all that. So how in the world could they possibly go spy the land that God had promised them, that their ancestors had lived for and died for and never sought, and knew that it was the end of the journey, that everything that God had taken them out of Egypt for, it says in Parshish Bahar, I am God who took you out of Mitzrayim to bring you to Eretz Canaan to be your God because I can't be your God anywhere else. Only Eretz Israel. The Talmud says that anybody who lives in Chutzlart, Ke'ilu Elu Eloka, it's as if they have no God. Where it says, Talmud says it. And this is being written by people living in Chutzlarts, <laughs> living in Babel. Not Jews living in Israel. These are Tanoim who wrote this, and they were living in Babel. And as holy as Babel was, they knew. When the Rambam, Maimonides, signed off his letters, he was forced to live in Egypt to, to save his life, he signed his letters every single time. Moshe bin Maimon, the one who was over three mitzvahs every day, because I'm living in Egypt. And they go, and they spy the land, and they come back and give this evil report right in front of God. Talk about a suicide mission. What do you expect's going to happen? God's going to go, oh, I never thought about that one. Good point. You know? Okay, everyone stay in the desert over here. What were they, exp what were they thinking? What was going to happen? Even more surprising is the reaction. What's the reaction? God says, okay, I've had enough of everybody over here. You guys complain, you know, and finally, it's Israel. I, I'm, we're right there at the border, about to go in. So you spy the land, is premature, whatever. But, but this is Eretz Israel. This is Eretz Kodesh. This is the land I promised to Abraham and Yitzchak and Yaakov and Yosef and everybody. And this is what history is all about. This is the completion of history. And here you are at the border. And, no, we don't want to go in. And you know, because of that, 
you're all going to die in the desert. And they all go like, oh, what? You're kidding. We didn't know. We, we, thought, we, thought, we thought you'd agree to all this. We, we, we thought it was a mitzvah to stay here in the desert. We thought we're doing the right thing. Okay, we'll go now, we'll go now. Go. Like Boker told us. <laughs> like, what were you thinking? What, was, yeah. what were you thinking? So either they were, they were looking to kill themselves. You know, come on, like, send the lightning down. Here I am, strike me. You know, hold the middle pole or something. Like, what were they thinking? The only explanation is they thought they were doing a mitzvah by staying in the desert. It's the only explanation. How, you know, how could they be so surprised? How could they stand there in front of God and reject the land he's giving if they didn't think it was a bigger mitzvah to stay in the desert? Otherwise, why would they be surprised when God says, no, that's a big mistake. We're not on the same page anymore. And you know what? The children that you were worried about, that they would die along the way, and, and in Eretz Israel, they'll go in. You'll die in the desert. They'll enjoy themselves in the Holy Land. They all panic. Well, we didn't see that coming. So then what did you see coming? What were you thinking? So there is an explanation. It's actually a very good explanation. And you have to understand why it's wrong and why it's still wrong today. The Zohar says, and it brings the verse that we say into Helam, Tanu oz lelokim, give strength to God. And it says in Parsha Zinu, right? Sur Teshi, right? You weaken the rock that bore you, right? And the Zohar explains what do these verses mean? How can you possibly strengthen God? And how, how can you possibly weaken God? We are raised with the philosophy, the Hashkafa, that God needs nothing. He's invincible. He is completely complete. There's nothing we can add to him, and there's nothing we can take away from him. So how can I possibly strengthen him, and how can I possibly weaken him? So the Zohar explains, because God makes it, he, act, he fakes it. He acts as if he needs us. He will act strong if we're doing the right thing. That's what it says, right there in the Zohar. If you, in fact, the verse says, Hashem shemrecha, Hashem sucha al yeminecha. God is your protector. He's your shadow off your right hand. And the Zohar explains, what does this mean? He's your shadow. It means that, that basically when I move my hand, my shadow follows my hand. My hand is what makes the movement, and the shadow follows it. It's, the shadow shadows my hand. That's why it's called the shadow. So God shadows us. We do something, the Zohar says, you smile, God smiles. You're depressed, God's depressed. You're sad, God's sad. I'm going, you know, I'm sad. Will you probably, you know, finally, you know, make me feel better? God's saying, well, first you feel better, and I can feel better, and I can make you feel better. He's like, it starts with me. I have to first do it. God, in order to give us free will, and to make our free will count, it has to be that our free will has consequences. That we can make decisions to make the situation better, or we can make decisions to make the situation worse. But either way, our decisions have to make a difference. So therefore, God says, in order to be able to empower you with free will, I will act as if I am strong when you do the right thing, you live by Torah and do mitzvahs and you're morally responsible, then I will act strong. But if you act in a way that's not in constant with Torah itself, I will act weak. And that's why there was a Holocaust, and that's why there are pogroms, and that's why Jewish history is filled with all kinds of negative events, and it's because God's responding to us. He can stop everything. No one has any power if God wants that person to have no power. No nation, no person, nothing. There didn't have to be a Holocaust if God doesn't want one to happen. Why does he want one to happen? That's all different discussion. But the bottom line is, is that God will act as if he's strong when we're doing the right thing, and he will make himself as if he's weak if we're doing the wrong thing. Now plug that into the spies, and you have the following thing. The Jewish people, they spy the land. And what do they see? It's a beautiful land, but there are nations living there. And they know, in order to conquer these nations, it takes a lot of strength to be physically strong, and, and, and you have to have, you know, militarily, you, know, you have to be strong and have weapons, and, and you have to have merits. Because in order for God to help, you have to have merits. The bigger the miracle, the more merits I have to have. 
if, if there's not a big miracle involved, it's more of a, a more natural thing, there's less divine providence directly involved, and therefore relies more upon me. But the bigger the miracle, the more I want God to be involved in my life, to do things that I can't do, I have to have schuyot, I have to have merit before he'll do that. So the Jewish people look at the land, they look at themselves, and they've had this problem of, with self-confidence the entire way through. The entire time, ever since they left Egypt, they did have a slave mentality. They were used to being nobodies. That's what they were told for hundreds of years by the Egyptians. You're nobodies, you're slaves, you're subhuman. And they're, they're in the desert, and even though God's taking great care of them, they're still concerned about their merits, that maybe we don't have the merit that warrants the miracles necessary to conquer the kings of Canaan. We, can't, we didn't have the merit in Mitzrayim either, for that matter. We, didn't have, we did not have sufficient merit to survive in Egypt and have the ten plagues occur. We didn't. We didn't. That's why Moshe says to the Jewish people, you're going out of Nisan, and, and they say, that's not possible. There's only two ways to leave Egypt. Either you're militarily stronger, and we're certainly not that, or it will take fantastic miracles, and we lack the merit for that. So, God, so Moshe says, well, that's true, but nonetheless, God's taking it anyhow. We can't argue about miracles in the past. We can't say, well, they didn't take place. They did take place. We get to the Yam Suf. So Moshe says to the Jewish people, go ahead and cross. It takes a big miracle to cross the Yam Suf. <laughs> a huge, I mean, to split the sea for the whole nation to go across and save us from the Egyptians. That takes a phenomenal miracle. And therefore, tremendous merit. We don't have it. So Moshe says, but... But in Egypt, you didn't have it either. And the miracle still took place. Yeah, but we, we, can't, we can't argue in the past, but maybe we had enough merit, or maybe God did that without the merit in Egypt. But how do we know he'll also do the same thing now by the sea? We don't know. So we're worried, we're concerned. So Moshe explains how it works to go in. And this is going on the entire time in the desert. They never know. Maybe the miracle's going to stop. It's like somebody I know is talking to him. You know, he looked a little concerned, a little worried couldn't figure out how he's going to pay the Mokola bill this month. Didn't know where the money was going to come from. So I asked him, so how did you pay it last month? Oh, A's and A's. <laughs> it's a big miracle. You wouldn't believe it. The same problem, but the last second, the last second, you know, a check came from here, this came over here, just enough to get by, paid the bill, I paid the bill. What about the month before that? It was a bigger miracle. <laughs> he goes back 15 years of miracles. And I'm going, that's 15 years of miracles, you know. He goes, yeah. <laughs> what are you worried about? He says, but maybe last month was the last one. Maybe God carried, I don't know. Maybe God carried me until last month. And this month, God says, you're on your own this time. I mean, come on, enough of the miracles already. Maybe. Well, that's where Bittuchon comes in. You have to believe that God will, you know, in the future. In fact, the fundamental difference between Emuna and Bittuchon even though they sound like the same concepts, they're not exactly the same. Imuna, like the word uman, means like a professional, right? Goes on the past. Bitachon is the projection of Imuna into the future. What does that mean? God says, I took you out and I showed you. I proved myself. He goes out of his way to say, I proved myself and my loyalty and the extent to which I'm prepared to change this world for you. We didn't have to cross the Yam Suf. In fact, we are past the Yam Suf. God brought us back to the Yam Suf, made us take a circuitous route, specifically, so we would have to cross the Yam Suf. Why? So he could do the miracle. He wanted to do that miracle, right? Hey, Moshe, watch this one. <laughs> wow, I thought I saw everything. And a C2? That's amazing. God, you're amazing. You know, like, yeah, he wanted to do the miracle. So he brought us back to the sea. Why? Because he was telling us, look what I've done for you until now. Look what I've done until now. Now, trust me in the future. And Muna goes on the past. Muna says, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a professional, right? You bring your clothing to a dry cleaner because you trust him. If he's opening up for the first week and he has no reputation of being a good dry cleaner, you do not bring anything but your kitchen towels. You're not going to trust him because he might make a mistake. But after years of bringing clothing to him and he proves himself, he's reliable, you'll now bring better clothing. You'll trust he will not ruin it in the future. What he's done in the past is a muna. What you're trusting him now with the future is bitachon, into the future. And that's what the Jewish people struggle with the entire time. 
So they get to Eretz Yisrael, and they spy that land, and they say, you know, there's giants here, there's people bearing these, it's a strange land. Look at the size of the fruit. We're not ready to conquer the land. You know what's going to happen? We don't have the merit. We don't have the ability to, to, con to overwhelm the kings. 31 kings of Canaan, it's a lot of, a lot of kings, a lot of nations to fight. And therefore, what's going to happen, follow this, right? We'll lose. Not because God, you know, Rashi brings down, the Talmud brings down when they say, this is part of the question, right? They say that they're stronger than Menu. The Talmud says Menu means not us, but him. They're stronger than God. These are people who witnessed the destruction of Egypt, the mightiest nation on the face of the earth, miraculously. They watched the sea split, and they had problems with God defeating 31 kings of Canaan. They're stronger than God. No, not, not because God can't outstrength them. For sure he can. He's much more powerful. But since God makes his strength dependent upon us, and we're weak, it's as if he's weak. And therefore, we're concerned, they're saying, that if we go into the land now, lacking sufficient merit for the miracles necessary to conquer the land, we'll lose the battle. And the nations of the world will say, oh, he could take them out of Egypt, he could destroy the Egyptians, he can split the sea, but he couldn't finish the job by taking his people all the way into the land, and that's going to be a historical major chil Hashem. Tremendous profanation of God's name. That's what the spies are thinking, based upon the Zohar. You follow? It makes a lot of sense. It's a good svara. It's, it's a good way of thinking. The only question is, why did it fail? And not just fail, but fail miserably. Because when God promises the Jewish people something, you don't need svaris. You don't need rationale. You don't need justification. God says, I am taking you to the land. Not today, not tomorrow, three days from now. Today, you don't have what it takes to, to conquer the land? Fine. I didn't send you. Moshe sent you. You wanted to go. I was prepared to go day by day by day. You chose to spy the land. You saw the land. You said to yourselves, here I stand today. I am not ready to take the land. God said, of course you're not ready. That's why I'm not taking you today. That's what spying means. You're going ahead of yourself. It's not where you belong. Bittachon says, wait until you get to that point. I'm constantly amazed to the point that I try and train myself to say, whenever I find myself, I find myself in a situation where I cannot see a solution to my problem. I tr before I panic, and I can't always do before I panic, but at least sometime, either before, during, or after the panic itself, I try and train myself to say, God, I don't know how this problem is going to be solved, but I can't wait to see how you're going to solve it. <laughs> because just because I don't have a solution doesn't mean he doesn't have a solution. Of course he has a solution. The Talmud says in Megillah, that before God brings the illness, he creates the, he creates the food, the truth of the medicine. It's already there. Whatever problem the Jewish people are facing, the solution is already in existence before the problem even occurs. It's a promise. And history proves it over and over and over again. They made a big mistake. Catastrophic. It was a turning point. The Jewish people, amazingly enough, they perpetrated, or at least they did not stop, the golden calf. Idol worship. Idol worship. They weren't really involved. Most of the Jews were not involved with the golden calf. The main problem by the golden calf was the mixed multitude, the Arab Rav. They made the golden calf, and the Jewish people should have stopped them, but they didn't. So God got angry and punished the perpetrators. But that was not enough to keep us from continuing on with our journey through Israel. If the golden calf had only been the sin, from that point onward, we would have still marched right from Har Sinai to Eretz Israel. What changed everything? The miraculous, the spies. That was it, the whole thing. All of history, it's amazing. We don't even think about them so much. Certainly the Jews of Chutzlarts don't think about them that much. They don't compare themselves to them. They don't think they have anything to do with them, basically. The Maragli was a story in the Chumash a long time ago. It's over. It's finished. We were punished. And here we are in the diaspora, waiting for Mashiach to come. But other than that, what's the connection? Everything. And even more so in our generation. Why? 
Why specifically now more than any other time in history? You're probably familiar with the Arizo, right? Rabbi Yitzhak Luria, one of the greatest Kabbalists of all time, certainly the last 500 or so years. He left behind a tremendous amount of information, knowledge that some of it's found in the Zohar. He explained the Zohar, but he also provided a lot of ideas and insights that had not been known previously. And you know, it discusses many different things. Most of our Kabbalah today that we learn, we learn from the Arizal. He taught Rav Chaim Vital. Rav Chaim Vital wrote down manuscripts. Eventually, they were found in Damascus, where he lived out the rest of his life. Eventually, they were put together, comprised what's called the Kisvi Arizal today. But eight, eight different Sha'ari, eight different gates of, uh, of, of Kabbalistic teachings that are the basis of most Kabbalah today. One of those gates is called Shar HaGilgulim the gate of reincarnations. One of the most fascinating works I've ever seen in my entire life. In fact, in fact <laughs> I had no intention of learning it. One of my neighbors showed up one day with a black safer called Shah Gilgulim. He wasn't sure how he got it. He bought to my front door, and he said to me, he said, you know, he knew I was learning a little of Kabbalah at the time, and he said to me, you'll probably be interested in this work. I have nothing to do with it. I have no interest whatsoever here. You could, you, could, you could hold on to it, you could learn it. I also wasn't interested at that point in time, the ghoulim reincarnation, you know, who cares? Right. Put on the shelf for months. One day, I was taking a bus someplace, and I was looking for a safety to take with me that might be interesting to look at you know, on, the, on the bus because I have my regular learning schedule, and Sharha Gilgulim was not part of it. And I thought, you know, let me take a look at the safer on the bus itself. Once I began, the safer I could not put it down. That safer literally changed my life for, for many different reasons, but this one particular paragraph was so instrumental in changing my whole outlook towards history, Eretz Israel, the Jewish people, and what we're supposed to be doing here. Why are we here? Because for the most part, the attitude of the Jewish people towards Mashiach, towards redemption, all these very important concepts is passive. Even though the Talmud says, they ask you six questions on your day of judgment. One of them is, see peace of Yeshua. Did you anticipate the redemption, the final redemption? One of the six questions they ask you, did you anticipate redemption? Now that's not so passive. That's more active. What does it mean to anticipate the redemption? I know if I'm anticipating a trip someplace, if I'm going to go somewhere, fly somewhere, and I'm anticipating leaving by a certain day, my whole week revolves around that. I'll be involved in other activities in the meantime, but I'll, it'll always be in my mind. And I'll pack my bag early, and I'll make phone calls, and I'll think about what I have to pick up and buy. And, you know, that's the way you anticipate things. A person anticipates getting married. You know, it's, the plans start very early in advance to make sure it's all set up in, you know, in time for the chasen itself. When you anticipate something, you prepare for it. So they basically ask you, did you prepare for redemption? Were you passive? Or were you active? But I'll just tell you one thing for sure. Anybody, anybody who's going to wait for Mashiach to come and tell him to come here will already be too late. Take a lesson from Europe. If we learn anything from Europe, if you wait until the point where it becomes so obvious that you have to leave, it's already too late. You know why? Because this world is about free will. It's about making choices. It's about being zealous on behalf of God and the things that he values that are important to him. He wants to see you choose on your own, not because you're being told by somebody else bigger than you, but because you have a love for it. That's why you're here, and they're not, for the most part. People with good reasons back there, it's a different story, but people who could be here, well, right? because, because you're zealous. You have a desire. The Ratzon was there. It brought you here. And that's what God wants to see. That's the correction. That's the tikkun for the maragli. Because all of Jewish history, ever since Parshish Lachacha, has been about one thing and one thing only, a tikkun for the maragling. And I'll prove it to you. Because it says in Shor HaGagulim the following thing. I don't have the exact quote here. You can actually see it in one of those books back there. right? But it says the following thing. It's actually in chapter 20 of Shor HaGagulim talking about various different issues and things to do with the final redemption. And finally, the paragraph, the Rizal says, 
via Rav Chaim Vital. He says, you know, in the final generation, Moshe Rabbeinu, Dor Hamidbar, that's them, right? And the heir of Rav are all going to reincarnate. They're all going to come back. Everybody. They're all going to come back. You know, curtain call at the end of history. Eh, they were dead a long time ago. Forgotten people, not so forgotten. The souls, not the physical bodies, they're not going to come back. That's in Tehillus and Mason, if they come back. But the souls of the Maragli are going to come back in the final generation as part of Dor Midbar, the generation of Jews that went out of Egypt with Moshe into the desert with the heir of Rav and with Moshe Rabbeinu. That's what it says. The question is why? I know that we recycle everything today, right? But there's more than enough souls to go around. We don't have to bring them back because God says, ah, oh, you know, it's getting messy up here. Send some of those souls back and start recycling again. They're doing it down there anyhow, so recycle the souls. No. Souls come back for one reason and one reason only. Tikkun. Rectification. To fix up what you got wrong the first time, and the second time, the third time, the fourth time, and the fifth. If you're tired, extra spell you're tired, not because of the heat, more than likely because you've been here several times already. Anyone living here today is definitely a Gilgal. Nobody is here for the first time. Probably here several times, many times since the beginning of history. But they come back because they have to fix something up. The Jewish people, you know, at that point in time, it's like, you know, you know when it comes to, for example, childhood traumas, God forbid a child goes through something that's traumatic and they don't have the opportunity to work it out, to fix it, to solve it, to resolve it, it stays with you. We have fears today that are irrational as adults because they're like from the childhood. It's as if our childhood stopped at that point in time. We may have grown physically, we may have grown in other areas, but in that one specific area, it's like, you know, for example, if you're driving along the highway or walking along a path and you see something disturbing, you stop and you start looking at it, you know, it catches your attention, and you keep you know, walking like this you know, like, you know, until you turn around, you notice nothing else, and even after you leave the event, it's going through your mind. It's as if you're still there. It's as if time stopped. When the Jewish people made the mistake with the Maranga, it's like time stopped. Thousands of years of history have passed in the meantime, but really, we're back at the time of the Maraglim. And whatever happened in the meantime was just to make up for certain things and fix up and prepare for the final showdown at the end of history, when Moshe comes back to finish what he started, the Erev Rav come back, and boy, are they a headache, right? And the, and the Dora Midbar come back to fix up, to make that correction. And what was that correction? The rejection of their Israel. That was the whole thing. They rejected it. And God says, not only have they rejected the land, but they have rejected me in the process. Whatever the, whatever the logic is. And that has to be rectified. So I once gave this talk years ago. I used to travel in the States and try to encourage people. The others and I go back a long way. Baruch Hashem. You know, and in one talk in New York, actually downtown New York, I was surprised I'm still here actually. I actually got out that night. But uh, I gave this, this talk, you know, and it didn't go over too well with some people. You know, some people slept, they snored, other people basically paid attention. You know, some people went to the bathroom instead. But the ones who listened and heard, you know, they got, they got really angry with this. You know, how could you say a thing like that, you know? And I said, you know, think about it for a second. You have no desire to live in Eretz Israel for whatever reason, right? You like it here, it's home for you, right? How do you know that that desire to live in Chutzlart, to reject the land of Israel, is not because you are one of those souls from that period of history, and you are now making the exact same mistake you made the first time, and failing at your test the second time? Didn't answer. He walked away. Just literally walked away. He didn't say nothing. Didn't say goodbye. Didn't say good point. Point well. No, just like literally turned around and walked away. I haven't seen him since. <laughs> if he made Aliyah, he didn't tell me. <laughs> but that's this period of history. That's what's going on right now. 
You know what's stopping it? You know what the most, most difficult obstacles that we have to overcome to get to that point, to fix up the miraculum, to get the Jewish people on side, to realize that's what we're doing over here? It says right there. If only Moshe Rabbeinu came back and only the Jewish people came back, we might all be here right now. We're almost there, by the way. You know, the population, just, just for, the, for the record, one of those historical things that people don't appreciate either. In 2005, the population of Jews living in Israel was 5,313,800. In 2010, the population is 5,802,900. In 2013, the population of Jews in Israel, not everybody, Jews only, okay, is 6,042,000. And finally, in 2014, I haven't updated since then, is 6,102,000. It's very good compared to what used to be 100 years ago. Just the same way, you know, they're building all this, these roads over here. Yeah, they're building them. Yeah, they have to expand these roads to Beit Shemesh and to Shalim, Tel Aviv, and all that. Because of what? This huge airport they built years ago. I remember driving by it, and I thought to myself, why? Who needs it? Hey, you know, it's like, you know, have to compete with all the other nations of the world, making you know, those competitions with airports and that, but, but, but that's them. What about us? We don't have all, we're complaining about a lack of money, and we have all this construction going on right under our noses because we are in the midst of kibbutz galios, the ingathering of the exiles. And God is paving the way, and it's happening literally right under our noses. Nobody's talking about it in the newspapers. The government is not, is not proclaiming it. They're just doing it because of whatever reason. But it's happening because we're watching right here. The population of Jews in the world today is put around 15 million. But that number is not accurate. You know why? Because when the world counts the Jews, they count Jews of all stripes, whatever they call themselves. If you're a half Jew because your mother was not Jewish and your father was Jewish, you're called Jewish. If you get a reformed conversion and you call yourself Jewish, you're also called Jewish. As far as the, the actual number of world Jewry might be more around 10 million, 11 million, maximum 12 million, but this number is real. Because since the Israeli government was mocked to make sure that anybody returning to the country was authentically Jewish, especially to get married, you have to prove these things, right? We know this number is accurate, which means at this stage of history, the amount of Jews living in Eretz Israel is probably either at the halfway point or just past it. I suspect just past it. And that has major historical and halachic ramifications. That means something tremendous. That means we're so well into the final redemption, we're not even so, we don't even see it so clearly, but it's actually taking place before our very eyes, under our noses. And there's a reason for that. That's not for tonight. That's the way it works. The Vilna Gom, in a sefer called Kol Hator, literally the voice of the turtle dove. Now, if you mention that sefer in, in certain circles, you'll be praised in some and vilified in others. The ones who praise you, I praise them. The ones who will vilify you, there's a reason why. On two levels. One is because it's the only safer that I know of to date that actually tells you what to do to instigate, to stimulate the final redemption. Apparently, it was the, the Vinogon's teaching, the Gras teachings, to his students back in the 1700s, early 1800s, to get all of this started. We're living here on their efforts. They came here, there was nothing. It was literally deadly when they came here. And they began the process because the Vilna Gon saw and believed and taught that the final generation had begun and we are living in Messianic times. And that's back in the 1800s. Even the 1700s at that point in time. And these teachings were passed down because they're only meant to be teachings for students, very Kabbalistic, but basically they encompassed Everything that we're supposed to know, or at least actually not everything, a, a good portion of what we're supposed to know and do to participate in the process of redemption. And Eretz Israel 
is at the center of all of it. And this Sefer primarily discusses a concept called Mashiach ben Yosef. Because we know there are two Mashiachs, right? Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. Mashiach ben Yosef pays the way for the final redemption. Mashiach ben David completes it. That's a one-two punch. Going back to the time of Yosef and Yehuda all through history, it's always working that way. If someone gives you the key to the executive kitchen, it makes you feel special. If they don't give you the key to the front door, it's worthless. Can't get in. I got the key. <laughs> Can't use it. Can't get through the front door. Let alone the kitchen, right? You have to get in. Mashiach ben Yosef is the key. The Sitra Achra, the opposing force in creation, the, the Eight Sahar, whatever you want to call them, that thing that interferes with us getting the job done. He does not want the final redemption to come. The good morning, the Talmud says. Why? He'll be out of a job. He's finished. Once Mashiach comes, the Yitzhahara is finished. No more free will. He's gone. So therefore, his job is to stop it. Anywhere he can, he stops it. He interferes with the process. And there's a whole long history of that. Now, he doesn't mind you talking about Mashiach and David. He doesn't mind you, you know, ending a, a lecture by saying, and Mashiach should come, the redemption should be, here we shall be. And there's this real thing. He doesn't mind it. You know why? Because you can't get there without going through Mashiach ben Yosef first. He's the key. He's the key. Because he begins the process of ingathering the exiles. He builds up Eretz Israel. He reveals sword, Kabbalah, and the, he does all the things necessary to pave the way for the final redemption, to make it possible for Mashiach ben, ben David to come. Without him, we're stuck. So therefore, to talk about Mashiach ben David, engage in discussions about the final redemption, no problem. You know why? Because he knows you can't have it until you have Mashiach ben Yosef, but comes a work, a safer that deals with Mashiach ben Yosef, and is all over that one. That's a death knell for him. That can't spread, that can't get out. So therefore, it's controversial. It's the first sign that something's important that comes to Judaism, the type of controversy. In this Sefer, the Vilna Gaon says, he says, at the end of history, the basically, you know, three negative forces and don't forget, he's writing back in the 1700s. It's long before history is what it is today. There'll be Yishmael, the Arabs, right? There'll be Asaf, and all the nations of the world, right? And there'll be the heir of Rav, the mixed multitude. Now listen what he says. This is incredible. I mean, you couldn't know this. Without, without Ruch HaKadosh, you could not know this, right? He says the main thing that the heir of Rav is going to do at the end of history is unify Yishmael and Esav against the Jewish people to keep them from their land. Now, if you had read that 100 years ago or 200 years ago, it wouldn't have made sense. Today, that's exactly what's going on. Because you have the left and you have groups in Israel that pretend, and the, and the other thing he adds, by the way, he says, and one thing you should know about the year of Rav, one thing that should be crystal clear about the year of Rav, he says, the way they work is bachizus anai, literally trickery, almost magic. Meaning what? Yeah, sleight of hand. In other words, they make it look as if you're, they're your friend, they make it seem as if they're working on behalf of the Jewish people, when in fact, behind the scenes, they're working against them trying to interfere with the final redemption. I'm going to stop it. And here's the clincher. He says it's the worst war of all. Not against Yishmael, not against Esau, against the Arab Rav, he says. Who are they? Well, the Zohar talks about five categories of Arab Rav. By this time, they're part of the Jewish people. When Moshe took them out, they were converts. They integrated. They become part of us. They're in us. We even have aspects in our own personalities. But you can tell the difference. The heir of Rav are those people that go to war against Judaism and Jewish values and the long-term national goals of Klai Yisrael. That's an heir of Rav type ten tendency. And he says it's the worst war of all because you can't tell who's who and what's going on and who to fight against you know, and who's really deceiving you. It's, it's complicated. But, but he says, you have to fight it. It's a war you have to fight. You have to get involved and you have to fight it and to stop them. Because, he says, 
If you don't fight against them, you are, by definition, one of them. And he even has one more thing. Better you weren't born at all. Yeah, so I got to that paragraph. You know, just turn the page. Right? What? what, what, was it? what? <laughs> Went back, read that again, and again, and again, and watched history unfolding before my very eyes, and literally the prediction coming true, and realizing what's actually going on, and understanding that all this opposition to Eris Israel, all this, sen this sentiment and feeling that we have time, we can wait until Mashiach finally comes and he'll bring us back and we'll come on carpets and our shuls. You know, people put shuls in their houses because the shuls fly to Israel. So they put shuls in their house to make sure they take the house with them, right? I hear it, right? The only thing is God says, the shul part I'll take, the house part I'll leave behind. <laughs> You know, you, you, can, you can fool yourself. You can't fool God ever. That we should learn by now, after all this time. But he says, that is the final battle. Just end off by, by making one very important point. Redemption is something that clearly is a function of national will. How do you actually bring it? What do you have to do? Until now, until recently, when I gave these talks, for the most part, it was like talking to the choir, as they say, right? Speaking to the converted. You know, there would be times, I'm, I'm saying to myself, like, I'm giving this all over. Everyone's like, yeah, they're all waiting. I'm not even here, yes, right? And I said, because they're all here. You all believe in this. And I thought, you know, well, this is the wrong crowd, but it's good practice, right? <laughs> for later on, at some point in time. Then I realized it's not true, because it turns out that there's something that we're all responsible for. Yeah, there's no question the people in Chutzlarts, they're way behind us. They're over there and they've got a lot to fix up and to, you know, to, before they're on board and, and to be involved in the whole process, redemption. But there's something that we all have to do. And it basically comes down to you know, what we see, for example, in the Chumash. It's a very important point. We see it's rhyme because uh, when the Jewish people left Mitzrayim, before they left Mitzrayim, that the slavery in, was intensified, Moshe says to God, why did you send me? I told you it would only get worse. And God says, now you'll see what I'll do to Paro. No, to Paro, this is part of the redemption process. Why was increased slavery part of the redemption process? Doesn't exactly explain at that point in time. We get to the Yamsuf, We're standing by the sea. And God says to Moshe Benu, ma titzakalai. Why are you praying to me right now? Why, why are you crying out right now? So we all, yeah, again, it's a good question. Why, why are you doing that right now? You know, the answer is because that's what you told me to do. That's what Jews do in trouble. You know, Moshe could have said, what do you mean, why am I crying? That's what, you, you know, that's, what else am I supposed to do? You told us that when, when we're in trouble, to pray to you, as we, it's a time-honored tradition of the Jewish people. Mati took a lie. You want to say, okay, I heard, I heard, okay, but go do, but what are, you, what are you questioning this? Why am I praying? right now. There's lots of explanations. The Zomer says that God says to Moshe, it's not going to work through prayer right now. Tell the Jewish people to walk into the Yamsuf and to keep walking. We know about Nachshim and Aminad that he jumps in first, right? But the whole nation has to walk into the Yamsuf and keep walking until they cannot walk any further without drowning, up into their nostrils. I mean, the guys who bought the scuba tanks and all that, they go a little further, but but I, until, they couldn't, until they couldn't breathe. Why is it so important? The Zohar says because it's talui in, in bitachon, right? Nefesh Echai, he brings down, explains that, that God was saying it's going to take bitachon to split the sea. Why not, why not Moshe's prayer? We saw in Parsha Kisisa that the entire nation is supposed to be destroyed because of their involvement in the golden calf. So what does Moshe do? He prays. And we're told that Moshe's prayer is so powerful he was able to save the Jewish nation. So he's got a powerful prayer. Parshas of Eschanan. Moshe says to God, let me in, let me in, let me in, let me in. Over 500 times, he davens to God. God says to Moshe, Benu, stop praying. If you pray one more time, I'm going to have to cancel the decree and let you in. I can't do that for historical reasons. And Moshe agrees and doesn't go in. But his prayer was able to change a decree that most of us can't even come close to doing. He has power for prayer. Mati took a lie because I got power for prayer. These, the people are stuck. What are we going to do? The Egyptians are over there. They want to kill us. The sea's over here. They want to drown us. So I'm praying. That's what, that's what I do. That's where my power is. Bill in this week's parasha says 
Right? Or Bullock says to Bilaam. Or Bilaam says to Bullock. Someone says somebody, to somebody. You know? But the power of Moshe is in his mouth. That's his power. So Moshe's praying. And God says, no, it's not enough. You know why? When you pray for something, it's called a bakasha. When you pray for something, you're asking for something that's not yours. If it's mine, I don't have to ask for it. I can grab it from your hands. If you owe me something, if it's my property, you owe it to me, I don't have to require, I could be polite and say, would you mind getting it back to me? But if you say, no, I can just take it. It's my property. I have to request things that are not mine. And then it depends upon whether or not I deserve it. So if I walk up to you and I say to you, can I borrow 50 shekels? You know, if we're friends, you know, you might say, okay, fine. That you know, was like, it's a lot of money, but uh, sure, here's 50 shekels. And I said, oh, good. Would you mind if I borrow 50,000? <laughs> now that I, th- I see that you're open to the 50, how about 50, th- just like, just like 100 times, 1,000 times, you know, no. <laughs> Are you kidding? It's a lot of money, but we're friends. Going back generations, my father and your father, his great, you know, yeah, it's fine, but 50,000 shekels is a lot of money. How can you guarantee it? It's not a simple thing to do. You want to you split a pond, a little pond, like there's a little pond in the path over here, and the nation has to go across this, this pond over here, and you want to need a little puddle, right? I once saw a cartoon like that. It's a cartoon where, where Moshe is a young child at the dinner table going like this, and the, and the water in his glass splits into two. <laughs> Practicing for the future. A little puddle, fine. Pray. It's enough. It's a small miracle. It's a miracle, but it's a small miracle. A whole sea for three million Jews and six million Arab rough? That's a huge request. Moshe, as powerful as your prayer is, it's not enough. It's not for you. It could split the sea, but not for all the people. That's a huge, massive miracle that you're asking for. There's not enough schus in your prayers. Moshe says, what are supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? So God says, tell the entire nation to walk into the sea and in the merit of millions of people trusting in God, walking into the sea. And not just in one lane, by the way, 12 lanes, one for each of the tribes. Incredible, incredible miracle. So what's going on over here? Why could Moshe not do it, but the entire nation could do it? Because at that moment in time, as the nation walked into the water, and they trusted in God, and they believed in God, and they forged forward on the path to redemption, there was a unified national will to survive the event that was so powerful that God was forced to respond with a miracle in kind. That is the power of national will for redemption. We're sitting here, twiddling our thumbs, going, when is he finally going to bring it? I mean, we've been waiting for thousands of years, and look at the situation. We've got the land back, Baruch Hashem. We built up the land, Baruch Hashem. We, we're, we're there, you know. When is he finally going to bring it? And you know what's going on, really? God's up in heaven going, twiddling his thumbs, giving a whole, when will they finally bring the redemption? I've been waiting for the longest time. When will the Jewish people finally bring that redemption? And it's a standoff. His thumbs versus our thumbs. Who's right? He's right. He's right. He says, I've done it all. Like a good father, I brought you the apartment. I built the apartment. I furnished the apartment. I got it all ready. But I cannot make you move in forcefully. It wouldn't work. It's not the same thing. You have to decide to do it. They have a lot of things to will over there. It's a lot of national will that has to develop amongst the Jews of the diaspora to get them here. But our job in the process in the meantime is to peace the Yeshua, to anticipate the redemption, to will it, to want it. We pray for it as if it's the only thing that counts these days. The redemption is at the door, literally. It's just sitting there. God put it at the door. He wants it to happen. He's not waiting for, he's waiting for us to make it happen with our national will. If we can get ourselves to yearn for it with everything we have, with everything we have, 
we can make it, we can make it take place. We can make it happen. We have to do that. You know why? Because either way, it will be national will that will bring it. Either way. But there's two ways that national will comes about. The nice way, when on our own, we develop it, we realize its importance, and we, we inspire ourselves, and we inspire others, and bring it out and show God and say, God, we're ready. We want it. That's the nice way. That's the peaceful way. Or there's the other way. What's the other way? Go back to the beginning, back in Mitzrayim, where the Jewish people are enslaved. And the slavery is bad, but they're all going, we'll adapt, we'll adapt. You know, well, it can always be worse, right? Famous Jewish say, it can always be worse. God says, I don't want it to be worse. Yeah, but we don't, we don't want to change right now. So, yeah, God, okay, so make it worse. It makes it worse, right? Finally, we get a pharaoh in power who has to bathe the, Jewish, the blood of Jewish babies. And the Jewish people say, that we can't adapt to. That's enough. We finally cry out to God, and God finally hears us. What's he hearing? The national will for redemption. We're here because of the Holocaust. But it took a Holocaust to build a national will that could make possible the return of the Jewish people after thousands of years back to our land. It was, he gives money. It was time. But the will wasn't there. It took a Holocaust to build up a national will to result in the reality of Eretz Kurdish, the, the Eretz Israel, the land we're living right now, to give it back to us and build it up. It took a, that's what it took to build up the national will. We don't want that. That's what the war of Gog and Magog is for. It's looming overhead. It's in the Gemara, it's in the Tanakh, it's, it's everywhere. It's not a myth, it's there. Kind of a threat. You know what it is? It's God saying, look, you build up the national will, I'll drop the Gog and Magog thing. But if you don't, I'll build it up that way instead. We gotta do it. And the sooner we do it, the faster we do it, the more we mitigate the circumstances that bring about a war of Gog and Magog, and we can finally end this insanity with sanity instead. Okay, thank you for coming. <laughs>